history. Back in 1974, a woman's body was discovered in a field in Norfolk. She'd been murdered and, somewhat bizarrely, her head was missing. For over 30 years, police have been unable to identify her and, without knowing who she is, there's very little chance of solving the crime. Well, tonight, we need you to play detective. Can you piece together the clues that Science Night provides and give us that all-important name? Watch closely, and if you can help, do call us. Somewhere out there is a brutal killer who for 34 years has kept a very sinister secret and I personally would like to find him. Even uh, by standards of the modern world, this was a pretty brutal killing. Police, there's a body in our field. She's definitely dead. Her head's missing. Well, th this woman was discovered in a, a rural location uh, near Swatham in Norfolk, uh, and she was found dumped, uh, clearly having been murdered, and uh, the body had been decapitated, and the head has never been found. She was found in a St. Michael pink nightgown. First thing that leads me to think is that this person has very likely been murdered in a home, very likely in her own home, because uh, it would be unusual, to say the least, for people to run about in the streets dressed only in a nightdress. And I think that's an important flavour to the case, that this might well have actually been a domestic killing of some sort. body was bound up in, in a way that would, would be likely to facilitate transportation, really, with the arms bound behind the back and the legs bent at the knees. She could have come from anywhere. This, this, this is the thing. I mean, the, where she was found is quite near a main road, and she, well, she, she could have been murdered miles away and, and just dumped there. Of course, it was important to, to search the whole of the scene and the area around the scene. We, we spent a long time, obviously, looking for the head. The main thing was to get the body to the mortuary and arrange for a pathologist to examine the body. He was able, for instance, to identify the fact that she was of short stature, something in the region of five foot two or so, and that she was of plump build. And although it, it sounds like not a lot, uh, you would think in, in a fairly small community, somebody would know, well, that sounds a bit like such and such, who w went missing a few weeks ago. The first thing we were trying to achieve was to identify who this young lady was. Um, and in order to do that, we embarked on a process to trace every woman of the description of the young, per the young woman who was found. And... Um, that consisted of mainly doing house-to-house -house inquiries. Well, of course, in those days, we had no computer systems, we had no mobile telephones, we had a very limited method of communicating and of keeping information. And every piece of information that came into the incident room needed to be indexed. And we used this, this system here. In fact, these are some of the cards from the incident room. We probably visited and spoke to about 15,000 people in the six weeks of the main part of the inquiry. But the original investigation soon ran out of steam. I think all of us felt a sense of, um, of frustration and sadness that we hadn't identified 
either the victim or, of course, the perpetrator. I still think that had we been able to find out who she was, we would have solved it. 34 years later, and the case is reopened, D.I. Andy Guy is now in charge. Firstly, uh, I reviewed that the whole file, everything we had, has been examined and re-looked at. We've also had a look at the exhibits, the nightdress that she was wearing, the string, the the cover that she had, and we've carried out various tests on those, uh, and there are still some results that we're waiting for. But the most important thing is we exhumed the, the, the woman on the 16th of April this year, and um, from there we were able to get a DNA profile. So now we have a reference point of the, of, the, of the woman's identity. We just need to put a name to that woman. After three decades underground, the victim's body was reduced to just bones. A forensic anthropologist was drafted in to examine them. Well, the bones can be very much affected by the conditions in which they are lying. And some bones can be very badly damaged and some almost not at all. Now, in this case, the bones were slightly worn away by water passing through the grave. But they were still largely well enough preserved that I could get some evidence from them. One of the key things I was able to find from the pelvis was a slight change that suggests that this woman might have had a pregnancy, which is a new piece of information to the investigation. I've got here two bones of the pelvis to show you, and this one, you can see, is quite plain in this area, whereas this one is damaged, and this is the damage that takes place in late pregnancy. It's not absolute proof, but it's quite suggestive. The most frustrating thing about this case is that it is so solvable. The, the woman that's here would have been known to somebody, they would have had friends, neighbours, sisters. One phone call from that person could turn this case around very quickly. I've always felt how sad it is that we've got that young lady in the cemetery at Swaffham in an unmarked grave, and how nice it would be for us to be able to put a marked headstone on her grave with all of her details and some message from her relatives. Well, I'm joined now by D.I. Andy Guy. It seems amazing to me, Andy, that back in the summer of 1974, no one came forward to say that this poor young woman was missing. Well, lots of women were reported to Norfolk Police as missing in 74. In fact, the original inquiry did locate 109 of these people nationwide. But of course, we know that a lot of people are going missing and never, ever report to the police. And the other thing, that the other problem we have is that um, it may be possible that we missed a woman report to us in the original inquiry. Yeah, I mean, in a sense, the bad old days, really, we saw the hundreds of index cards and old-fashioned policing. Of course, things have changed a lot now. Yeah. DNA profiling being a significant part of this investigation now. Yeah. What I'm hoping tonight is that someone will ring up with a name of, of missing females. And what we can do from there is go to the family of those females that were missing in 74 and are still missing now, obtain a DNA profile from the family, and then compare it with the victim. Uh, that was buried in Swaffham Churchyard. Now, for somebody who may have had a young female friend that went missing, there was a very important fact here. We saw from the uh, pathologist, the forensic pathologist, that her pelvis showed signs of, if not childbirth, then certainly a very late pregnancy. That's sure. a big difference from the clues in 1974. That's absolutely right. The original postmortem suggested that a woman had never had children, and women missing persons were ruled out of the inquiry because they hadn't had children. Of course, now Corinne and Nat are saying to us that there's a strong possibility that she did have children, or at least get into the late stages of childbirth. Okay, so this tonight might be your final big last shot at it. Who is it that you're appealing to tonight to get in touch? Okay, well, people don't just go missing. When they disappear, they are missed by people. So what I'd appeal to anybody who had a, a family member, a friend, a work colleague, or somebody they used to socialise with that went missing in 1974, and they're still missing today to get in touch. Even if they reported that person missing back in 74, give us another call. Okay, and we also want to remind people that you don't need any more information on the night dress or indeed uh, this cover-up that was used here that we saw in the film. You've, you've exhausted those possibilities. Absolutely. It's missing people. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Andy. If, if you can help, then the number is there on the screen. If you've been a victim of crime, that is, of course, the victim support line, 0845 30 30 900. And if you are interested, I have to say I am, in the fascinating work of the two experts that were featured in that reconstruction, we've uh, filmed some special interviews with them from our website. The forensic pathologist, for example, talks about his role 
on the Soho murders investigation and the case of the five women you'll remember murdered on the streets in Ipswich. That's at bbc.co.uk slash crimewatch.